Father, thank you for the day we've had already, being able to sing so many songs about redemption and your mission in coming to save. Thank you for that and for an opportunity to quiet our hearts and minds before you, Lord. It is so easy for me to be distracted by the cares of this world and the, the things that demand attention. And It's refreshing to be able to spend some time being quiet and then talking to you in prayer. What a, what a blessing we have. Lord, I pray as we open your word today, you'd give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to us, and that life would come forth, and we would just know you a little bit better. And I thank you for it, Father. Amen. <clears throat> We've been talking about the blood covenant, and our Bible is a book of covenants, as we know, or throughout it, but it's broken into the two covenants, old and new. We enter into the new covenant through Jesus Christ, the, the last Adam, the covenant head of a new race, and new by definition is contrasted with the old, and as Hebrews says, replaces the old. <clears throat> We've looked into two divine covenants so far, I guess three depending on how you break down the one with Abraham that we started looking at. Noah was the first one where God made a covenant with Noah and said, I will, no, I will never again destroy the world with a universal flood. And then we looked at this really interesting one from my point of view with Abram who turned into Abraham where out of all the people in the world, God chose him and made a covenant with him. And he said, your descendants are going to be many and, and the descendants of the whole uh, world are going to be blessed. And we know that was through Jesus Christ. And we looked at Genesis 15 and, and saw this blood covenant being made where God uh, said to Abram, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And you're going to, if you can count the stars, that's how many descendants you're going to have. And Abram believed God, and God counted it as righteousness for him. And he put him to sleep, and then cut these animals in two, and we went through all of that, and, and established this covenant of circumcision that, that all the descendants from that point on entered into uh, this covenant. And then we looked a little bit at the new covenant, because we don't enter into the covenant now through a, a physical circumcision, but through the Holy Spirit cutting the flesh of our heart away. And we become new creations in Christ, which I just want to read this because it's so good. And then I'll come back to what I want to talk about. But Paul wrote this in, a, in Ephesians 2 verse 11. And the big issue of their day was what to do with Gentiles and Jews and how are they going to mix together and all of that. And he says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separate separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace." And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows in a holy temple in the Lord, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place by God, for God by the Spirit. I, there's way too much to develop in there, but the bottom line is this issue was settled in Christ between who is now part of the covenant. And he gets very clear at the end of Galatians, and we looked at this, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. We don't enter into the covenant now because of the family we were born into or the race we were born into. We enter in now through the blood of Jesus Christ. We ended last time looking at chapter 17 of Genesis, and I want to go back there. And the covenant that God made with Abram and changed his name to Abraham. And, and then in verse 15 through 22, you can go back and read it when you want, but basically it's this discussion about uh, God says, I'm going to bless Sarah with a baby. And he says, are you kidding me? She's an old lady. That's paraphrased, but 
and I'm an older man, and, and come on, you know, and Abraham was struggling with this. He says, oh, that Ishmael may live before you. And God says, I'll take care of Ishmael, but I'm bringing my covenant through Isaac. I am going to do that. And I will establish my covenant, verse 21 says, and Sarah will bear you a son this time next year. And, as, and we know what Abraham did. He circumcised everybody and everybody went into the covenant. But the thing I want to focus on is that some of the stories that follow make more sense to me if you look at it through covenantal eyes, if you look at it through the fact that Abram is now Abraham and he is in partnership with God Almighty through this covenant. And so you have this discussion going on in chapter 18. You remember this with uh, Sodom. God shows up with the two angels and he says, I'm going to wipe Sodom off the face of the map. And, and Abraham, Abraham starts negotiating with him. <laughs> you know, the 50 and the 45 and the 30 and he gets down. That makes sense in light of a covenant relationship because he had a right as a covenant partner one, that God would tell him what he's going to do, and two, that he has a right to argue with him about it. Are you sure you want to do this, God? Because I always read that and I thought, what was going on here? Why, what is happening? And it makes more sense to me that way. How about this one? You get to Genesis 22, and, he, and God says to Abraham, I want you to take Isaac, and I want you to take him out and kill him and offer him to me. And there is not a single peep out of Abraham. In fact, it says he gets up early the next morning to start the journey. And I've always wondered about that, and I thought, what? I know I would be saying, God, are you kidding me? I'd like a couple fleeces here. You know, let Isaac be wet today and dry tomorrow or something, you know. <laughs> Nothing. And, and, but it makes sense if a covenant partner can ask you anything, and knowing who he's in covenant with, you do not refuse a covenant partner. And I know that God was testing Abraham, and I know, I know there was a mixture of faith in there, and God had promised to bring uh, the, the, covenant, the, the covenant of promises through Isaac, and he said, hey, even if he kills him, I know he'll raise him up. And I knew all that was in there. But in the background somewhere is this understanding of covenant. You cannot, will not refuse a covenant partner, no matter what they ask, and this was crazy. He clearly demonstrated faith and obedience. And as I thought about this, how old do you think Isaac was when this went on? Anybody got any ideas? Well, I mean, in little arch books, he's always this little tiny kid. But how old do you think he is? 14? He's one? 17? 18? You know, you, you read through the Old Testament literature, some of the, some of the Jewish uh, historians and stuff have him at 36. The, the point is he was old enough to carry a bunch of wood to do a sacrifice. Abraham, at this point, is well over 100 years old. Now, if Isaac didn't want to be tied up and laid on an altar, do you think he could have got out? I think he could have. I think he could have run. So that speaks to me the fact that Isaac had some understanding of covenant. He had some understanding of faith because he's going to let Abraham tie him up, lay him on top of a bunch of wood, and kill him. And you're going, sometimes, you know, I, I get frustrated with Isaac, some of the things he did. But he obviously understood something that was going on here because that would have been me. I would have been down the mountain waving at Abraham. Bye, buddy. <laughs> See you later. And he didn't. He let him tie himself up. And you move on through Genesis and you, you get to this place where God appears to Jacob and he says, you're no longer going to be Jacob, you're going to be Israel and I'm going to fulfill my covenant that I made to Abraham through you. Well, the next big covenant that comes is in Exodus. The, and we know the story. We know the story very well. Exodus is where the children of Israel, they move down to Egypt. And there's like 70 of them when they start down there, and then there ends up being a whole bunch of them when they leave. But it's to fulfill what God had told Abraham in the dream. Remember when he was making the covenant, and Abraham was put to sleep, and he's laying there, and he has a dream, and he says the people are going to be there for 400 years. They're going to be down in Egypt. And so what's going to happen is God's going to make a new covenant with Moses, and it's at Sinai, the mountain there. But before we get there, we need to stop and think about what was going on, because I think we blow past this stuff sometimes, and we just don't think about it. You get to this, it's a strange passage to me, really, in Exodus 2. It says, During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. This is the first record of them crying out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham, Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Hundreds of years had passed. We read through this, we go 400 years. Okay, how old is the USA? How old are we in America? Are we 250 yet? 
Aren't we coming up on 250? We're like 230 something. How many you homeschool guys ought to know this stuff? Just we're 200 and something, right? We're not even 250 yet. 230 what? 238. 238. Thank you. This is 400 years, and we blow past that sometimes. And we think they have been slaves for 400 years. Traditions had been passed down generation after generation after generation. They were enslaved. They grew up, they lived as a slave, they died. Their life was a grave, or I guess a rut with the ends blown out, basically. What hope or what future did they have? None. What did you, your dad do? He was a slave. What did your grandfather do? He was a slave. What did your great-grandfather do? He was a slave. How about your great-great-great-grandfather? Oh, he was a slave, too. Well, how about your great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather? Oh, yeah, he was a slave. Slaves all the way back, 400 years. That's a long time. And whatever our view of slavery may be, it probably isn't harsh enough. The Pharaoh is saying, I want you to take the kids that are born and throw them in the river. <laughs> harsh treatment, growing up like this for a long, long, long time. God hears them crying, so Moses is born. And then 80 years later, some things start happening. But we know the story so well, but sometimes we don't think about why God did what he did. What was God after? And what was he doing? These people had lived their entire life as slaves. No rights, no freedom whatsoever. And we know the, the plagues come along. Hopefully you can see that, but there's... Uh, I found this little button in the school. You got, you got the water, and you got the frogs, and the gnats, and the flies, and, and you, know, you go through all these different plagues. You get all these things that come. And they're a story in themselves. But the question I want to ask is, Why? Why these plagues? Why not some other plagues? I don't think they were random. I don't think God just thought, gee, what can I do to them today? You know, maybe we'll have frogs, or maybe we'll have lice, or maybe we'll have gnats, or, or whatever it is. Why these plagues? See, God was going to release his people, who, who had generationally been slaves, and he's going to give them detailed laws of how to do basic things that you would think we'd understand to do. Have you ever read, read through the law? I read that sometimes, and I'm going, really? You've got to tell people this? Yeah, they do have to tell them that because they didn't know any different. And so he's going to give them all these laws and he's going to release them. And yet, I'm not sure they even knew who God was. What had they been living under for hundreds of years? Living underneath Egyptian magicians, living underneath Egyptian deities. Hmm. Why these plagues? Well, in Exodus 12, 12, we get a little insight. He says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Many believe, and I'm one of them, that God systematically dismantled the gods of Egypt. And he did it not just to show Egypt how fake their gods were, but he needed to show them to his people how fake the gods were. And I, you probably won't be able to see this very well, but it'll be on the slides and you, you can uh, get it online or, or wherever you look for these things. But let me just go through some of it. And guys that are a lot smarter than me, this is actually from Barnes Bible charts down here. But they list the plagues over here, all the different plagues. And we're pretty familiar with these, the, the ten that are here. You got the water and the blood and the frogs and the lice and all this stuff. And then they've got all the gods of Egypt that these guys worshipped all through here. And each one of them specifically tied to the various plague, like the frog one, you know, the frog goddess of Egypt. Isn't that great? Said her face was a frog, you know, and they worshipped the frogs. And so what does God do? He says, you want to worship frogs? Have some frogs. <laughs> Have lots of frogs. And I'm sitting there, I'm reading this, and I'm yelling at, at, at Pharaoh, because he's not the sharpest tool in the toolkit, apparently. And, he, and Moses says, well, when do you want me to get rid of the frogs? How about tomorrow? And I'm saying, how about now? How about right now? Get rid of the frogs. No, they stay and they heap and all this sort of stuff. You get the, you know, the, the, girt, the, girt, the dirt god, you know, and so you, you have Moses reaching into a kiln and throwing ashes into the air, and they turn into these lice, and finally the, the magicians of Egypt, they say, this is the finger of God, we cannot do it. And, and the first few plagues over here, these first three anyway, happen to the Israelites as well. <laughs> They're living underneath this. I wonder why. I wonder what was going on in their brain. I wonder if they were thinking, they're conquered. <laughs> they have no rights. They're slaves. Maybe they were thinking some of these were real gods. I don't know. They might have been. The fly god, isn't that great? So what do they do? They have flies. And then you have, you know, gods of cows. That's great. 
you know, boils. This one's, this one's fun. The Egyptian goddess of, of healing. And so they have boils come on everybody. There you go, god of healing. Take care of that, would you? And they can't. They can't stand even before the magicians. Cannot even come to court with that. You know, you got the god, nut god. I like that. Nut. Egyptian sky goddess. And on and on it goes. You got Ra, the sun god. And, and, and you go through all of those and you're going, God was systematically the true God, destroying the false gods of Egypt. And I don't believe it was simply to show the Egyptians that they were wrong, but to show his people that those gods are not gods. Those gods have no power. For 400 years, they have been living underneath that system. What do you think they've been hearing? What do you think the kids were growing up hearing? God systematically destroyed it. Like I said, you can go look at that chart. It's kind of interesting. But he gets to this and he says, I am the Lord. They needed to know who God was and not who the false gods was. And we know this was a struggle for them. We know it was a huge struggle for them. They, they, they get led out in a day. Pharaoh finally does it after he's proved that he's not a god and his firstborn dies. And so they get delivered. They get cast out and they're, they're going through the desert. They've got a pillar of fire at night. They've got a cloud covering that's fallen them and I don't know exactly what they look like I've seen pictures and and they don't know what it looks like either but it must have been really been cool they go through the Red Sea they see Pharaoh's army destroyed they, they see the they they manna every day on the ground they're getting this food they've got a rock following them around where water's coming out of it that's weird but they've got it and they still had Egypt in them Moses goes up on the mountain to get this new covenant law, to get the rules and regulations of the law, and, and he's not even gone a few days, and what do they start doing? They make calf idols. Give me your gold. I love Aaron, you know, he's probably a third born. It's not my fault, you gave me the gold, I threw dinner, poop, it popped out. You know? I didn't have anything, the people made me do it. And you're going, really? You made an idol god? A gold idol calf, and they start dancing around or whatever, and Moses comes back down, he's not a happy camper. But, whoa, that gets small. You can read it. But think about what the first two commandments are when Moses does get the law. Ever think about this? God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. What's the first one? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is where? In heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them and serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Why those two commandments first? Why not other ones? Because idolatry was what they had grown up under. Generation after generation after generation. They had grown up and saw gods of the sky, gods of the land, gods of the sea, gods of the water, gods here, gods there, gods everywhere. God gives them the law and he says, I'm the Lord your God. You shall not have any other gods. You're not going to make any idols. You're not going to cast anything. You're not going to do this. And we say, oh, those foolish people. How could they do this? How could they do that? They know God's real. Really? What do we do? Let's get personal. Might as well, as long as we're here. You know, what, do we have anything that we struggle with in our life? That, what, what does it mean to have an idol? To put something in the place that only God should be in. And what do we do sometimes? What do we do? How many self-help books are there written? How many more do we need? A million, I guess. Do we worship ourselves? Are we God? Do we, do we put other humans in that place? If I could just be part of the cool group, my life would have meaning. Really? If I could just get this relationship, if I could just be this, if I could just be that. And instead of finding our satisfaction and our identity in whose we are, we put it somewhere else. Instead of finding our identity in Christ and what he's done and who we are in him, we try to put something else there, someone else there. These are just some off the top of my head that, that we struggle with. Like I said, ourselves, others, finances, relationships, employment, pleasure, sports, education, drugs, alcohol, ministry. Do you know that it's easy to worship ministry? 
Man, if I could just be in the ministry, life would be grand. I would have purpose and meaning in my life. You know what the number one thing is that pastors struggle with? Wondering if they have any meaning and purpose in their life. You know, it goes on. It's no different wherever you are because if you try to put something or someone in the position where God belongs and only God should be, God's going to say, you shall have no other gods before me. And that thing will not fill that hole. It will not satisfy you. It just won't do it. God is after a personal relationship with his people and has always been such. He spoke to Abraham face to face. Same with Isaac. Same with Jacob. Same with Moses. <laughs> he meets with me, and they're called friends of God. Have a relationship with God personally. God sent Jesus to become a man, a flesh and blood, real human man. And said, have a relationship. You could see him, touch him. John starts off his, his writings and he says, we held him. We touched him. He was real. God remembered his covenant with Abraham. And he loved his people so much that he gave them this dramatic lesson. <laughs> Dismantling the fake gods that they had grown up with generationally. He said, these are not gods. No god can stand in the presence of the real god. <laughs> Dagon always getting knocked down, you know, arms off one time, heads off the next. The last plague humbled Pharaoh so much that he had to admit he was not a god. And, and it set in motion the greatest illustration that there is, in my opinion, in the Old Testament. You've got the blood being applied to the doorposts of the house. you got the angel of death. I don't know what the angel of death looks like. I like this one. It's kind of, hey, you can't hardly see it. But, you know, you, you watch some of the old movies and they'll have the angel of death going through as a green fog or as a, you know, whatever. I'm not exactly sure how all that happened. What's the Passover symbolic of? <laughs> What's it point to? We no longer have the blood of a lamb splattered on our doors. We have the blood of the Lamb of God applied to our hearts. <laughs> it is applied to our lives and our hearts. And our sins aren't simply passed over. They are forgiven. They're removed as far as the east is from the west. We not only can say, I'm the... I'm, I'm the whatever, I'm following God, I become a brand new creation in Christ. I'm forgiven, redeemed, justified, sanctified, born again, new creation in Christ because of that blood. Man, it just it doesn't get any better than that. You know, for, for years, millennium, they would, they would do this where they're applying the blood on there, pointing to the ultimate lamb who's going to come. Behold the lamb of God, John says. He sees Jesus coming, he says, Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What a word. What a word. It's exactly what Jesus was going to do. It's why he came. Jesus saves. Jesus saves, we sang today. That is what his mission was when he was here, primarily. The Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. To come and die the death that we could not die. That all those lambs in the Passover pointed to, that one fulfilled it. That lamb fulfilled it. He was examined. And he says, which one of you convicts me of sin? No one could. He was, he was, the lamb had to be perfect for a Passover lamb. Jesus was the perfect Passover lamb. He was the ultimate, final sacrifice. Not to cover over sin, remove it. But this lamb rose from the dead. <laughs> None of the other lambs down through history rose from the dead. Can you imagine? You know, <laughs> It won't stay dead. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And now he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> He's king of kings and lord of lords. And at his name every knee will bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father. He is God. This lamb is the ultimate fulfillment of what God promised. Adam in the garden, Abraham in his covenant with him. He's the ultimate fulfillment. The Bible from front to back is a story of redemption. God remembered, God heard, and God knew. You know what? He still does today. He heard the children of Israel. He still does today. So that's my first question. Do you believe that God knows and God hears and God remembers where you're at, your situation, your difficulty? Do you believe that? I do with all my heart. But you don't understand, things are terrible. I, 
I know. 400 years they were slaves. That's terrible. <laughs> and I don't understand all of it. And I don't know why God heard their cry and then he says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you a baby. And then 80 years later, I'll do something about it. And you're going, okay, God, your timing is not my timing. Your ways are not my ways. But God heard and he remembered. He remembered his covenant and he knew. Do you think God hears you today? Me today? You're crying out to God from a, a place of total misery or despair or, or, or rejection or something. Do you think God hears you? And he remembers and he cares. Yeah, he does. I don't have the answer for you many times. I, I, I know who does. It's not an idol. <laughs> it's not any of those things on that list. It's a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ through the blood. Is there anything that God, who we are in covenant with through the blood of Jesus Christ, we haven't even really developed that aspect of it all that much. We've looked at it a little bit, but we're in covenant with God. It was a, this is the blood of the new covenant, Jesus said, and we enter into that. And we are now in covenant with God. Is there anything that our covenant partner <laughs> could ask us that we would say, no, you can't have that, God. I'm sorry. God says, I'd like you to do this. Nope, not that one. I'd like you to stop doing that. Nope. I'd like you to go. Nope. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Is there anything like that in our life? God have mercy. <laughs> the Lord's gracious and He'll give us more opportunities. He doesn't just you know, one and done us. There's lots of opportunities. I, I believe He works with us till we take our last breath. Yeah. But I need, to, I need to stop and think, is there anything, God, that I'm holding back from you? Is there anything that I don't want you to mess with? Leave it alone. Most of us have that somewhere in our lives or our heart. Things we just don't want God to deal with or touch or to have. We sing songs, lay it all on the altar. God, I'll lay it all on the altar, except this. <laughs> you know, I, I still want that. Is there something like that in our life? It's, it's a question. Do we have any Egypt still in us? <laughs> Children of Israel, did they ever get over Egypt? How many times did they go back and back and back and back and back? They would say ridiculous things like, we had it so good in Egypt. We had all the leeks and onions we wanted. Ugh. They had them all. You're going, really? You were a slave for 400 years. But we can get deceived. And, and so I have to go to the Lord and I say, God, do I have anything in my life that, that is still there? That's the old Jeff, the old life that I just can't let go of or won't let go of. God, help me. I want to walk on with you in the new covenant, not the old way. I, I, just, I, just, I want it. So the bottom line question for you here today, maybe it's your first time here, maybe you've been here your whole life, is that are you in covenant with God through the Jesus Christ, the ultimate lamb, the ultimate lamb? Are you born again? Are you saved? Are you a new creation in Christ? You either are or you're not. It's not a sort of thing. You either are or you're not. <laughs> you can't halfway be in. It doesn't work that way. You're either new or you're not new. <laughs> and only you know. You know what you've done, what you've said, the process you've gone through. I'm not talking about have you fallen, have you failed, have you drawn up short. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life and Savior of your life? That's the fundamental question that we must answer. Talking to a bunch of people in front of a casket this week, saying the same thing. Are you ready to meet your Maker? Every one of us in here will step out of this life sooner than later and we will meet the Lord face to face. Are we ready? I'm in covenant with God. I'm ready. I am ready. I'm a blood-bought, forgiven, born-again, new creation in Christ. I'm ready to go. Do I mess up? Yeah. Have I fallen short? Certainly. Do I still fail? Regularly. <laughs> am I in covenant with God? Absolutely. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Are you? It's a question to ask, and I'd ask you to consider it while we pray. If you don't know the Lord, I would just beg you not to leave here until you do, yeah. until you know Him. So, God, I'm grateful for your word. Whether I've done a good job or not opening this up today, I, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and our lives, that you would let the things that are from you go deep into us, and the things that are flesh just blow away. Lord, let your word be living and sharp and active and bring conviction where conviction's needed, comfort where comfort's needed. 
insight where it's needed. God, please do a work in each one of our hearts, our minds, and our lives. And I, I thank you that you've invited us to know you in a deep way. God, I thank you that even as we sang so many songs today about your great love and your grace and your mercy, what can we say other than thank you, God, for loving us? You loved us so much you sent your son to die for us. And I thank you for that. I thank you, God, for that one time ultimate sacrifice to deal with sin. Thank you for that. God, we're so grateful. And Lord, I thank you that we still have time <laughs> to walk on with you. You give us grace to continue walking. Lord, for everyone who's listening to this, we're still alive. We still have time to make good decisions, good choices, to walk on with you. Thank you so much for it. Thank you for your great love. Let's pray, Lord, as we ponder these things in our hearts, that you would bring light and insight give you praise for it, Father. Amen.